Okay, welcome to Chengdu. <laughs> welcome to Chengdu. I'm here with my friend Luke, who is a fellow British expat and a medical AI PhD student in Shanghai. I'm going to ask him a couple of questions about his life and his thoughts here living in China, and then we will end the video with maybe a rapid fire round of questions. You want to give an introduction? Yeah, mate, sounds good. Let's walk. Yeah, so um, I'm Luke from the UK um, and I've been doing YouTube for as long as I've been in China really. So um, I've, I'm doing my PhD here and I've done a lot of videos related to my studies in China, also traveling around because like, as a PhD student, I don't really have any classes too much anymore. So it's just meetings. And so I'll do traveling. Uh, whilst doing online meetings. So it's a great way to do both. Why China? Of all places, why China? Why China? Um, I've always just been fascinated by it. It's like the, the land of mystery. No one really knows too much about it because like in the news you see it, very negative. Uh, so I didn't really have a clear idea until I did my master's degree in the UK, right? And I went to quite a, a top uni, uh, Warwick, uh, where a lot of Chinese students would come. Um, and because I was doing a major in statistics, British people are not too good at that. So all of my classmates, pretty much, were Chinese. And so I got, this was the first time I got to speak to Chinese people, find out the real China. Um, and so like they would tell me all about it, show me photos. I was like, oh, whoa, it is nice. So yeah, I went on like a little holiday, uh, loved the place, went to Shanghai, Hangzhou. And at that kind of time, I was also thinking, I want to do a PhD um, and yeah multiple reasons because I love China but also um, they it was the, the best option I thought I think in terms of my major China really good uh, AI um, and also coming here it's cost effective so like doing a scholarship getting that it's uh, easier than in the UK or the US it's pretty difficult to get a scholarship there whereas in China it was much easier so yeah that's why I decided really so what are some common misconceptions about China and what is the reality like on the ground? Uh, it's a good question. I'd, I'd say the biggest one maybe is maybe the lack of freedom. A lot of my friends, when I go back, they'll be like, hey, but Luke, you've got no freedom, right? I'm like, well, what do you mean by freedom? Um, you know, if, if you're talking about freedom, is it to carry a gun? Mm. Okay, so wh why, is that make, why does that make you free? You have a gun in case someone attacks you. So it's not the freedom isn't having a gun it's about being safe and so in America it's not so safe and so you might need a gun whereas in China it's totally safe to walk around do whatever holding this expensive camera around no one's gonna come and nick it all right whereas in the UK someone would easily take that on their on their bike or something so that's a really big one I think freedom I can do I'm trying to think what what can I not do really in in China that I can do in the UK I can live basically my life that I live in the UK so um, I just think coming here, I was like, wow, lots of things really blew my mind. There's so much. Um, and especially how, how, of course, how big it is, but that also means how diverse it is as well, China. So it's not, I don't know, uh, like my preconception was of China, it's just going to be like lots of rice farmers everywhere and it's very poor. But we're like looking around here, skyscrapers everywhere. I don't think, mm. is this a tier one city? I'm not even so sure. Tier two, maybe. I think maybe tier two, yeah. Let's take a look. Beautiful. It's pretty nice. I am uh, pleasantly surprised by Chengdu, actually. First time visiting here and Same. it seems to be pretty nice. And I'm sure it will be even nicer at night when people come out and uh, enjoy themselves. Okay, so you say that you do, um, not you say that you do, you do, uh, <laughs> So you, you do medical AI. You're doing a PhD in medical AI. Can you tell us a little bit about that? Sure. So, um, yeah, before I come to the UK, I was doing my a job in epidemiology. So I had a little bit of medical background. Um, and then I come here, or I just wanted to learn AI. And my professor was like, right, this is a hot topic, cancer. And I was like, oh no, I don't know anything about cancer. Um, and so it, he said it was all right because I'll be working with doctors, um, hospitals, and he'll help me as well. And I just need to make the model describe what they're saying cancer is. Uh, and so what my job is, uh, is to detect cancer early. Do you have cancer or not? And then once you know if you have cancer, 
how serious is it? Uh, and then, kind of morbidly, how long have you got left to live uh, based on multiple factors? Um, so it can help with uh, prognostics and treatments and things like this. Um, because there are a lot of false diagnoses uh, because you think that the early stage cancer very difficult to detect so using AI can do it very quickly and yeah a lot of hospitals they're utilizing this now so I literally work with hospitals uh, they'll give me the data and in return give them the model and they'll be using it on patients so it's uh, a lot of pressure you know um, it's gonna be saving people's lives but yeah, it's so great. you, it's you have the you have the inside knowledge about AI in China um, I suppose so, yeah. of course it's a, a specific kind of AI um, and it's a specific uh, way that it's utilized but um, from your inside knowledge how are China doing in terms of the big AI race between America and China because that is the next big thing isn't it yeah, that, uh, whoever dominates this is going to like dominate the global market. Uh, AI is going to take over. Um, it, it is competitive. America, I think they've just put in half a trillion US dollars into AI with OpenAI and other companies. Um, however, China, with all the sanctions they've had from the US, they've made very competitive models. Uh, so there's this company Deep Seek, um, which no one really knew about. And then all of a sudden, with all these sanctions, you know, they've got less chips and things like this, they're just as good. And it's, I think, 90% cheaper than the American one. So Amer the American uh, AI, they're, they're be quite expensive to use, um, whereas the Chinese ones, it's all open source. Um, and so like companies will be working with each other, universities will be working with each other, there's a lot of collaboration. Um, and so I just feel there's a big push in China with it. I, I'm seeing in my university, there's a brand new AI school that's just uh, going to be opened. There's a, there's a big push for AI and research here in China. So it doesn't matter about the sanctions, it doesn't matter about all this, it's about the innovation. And I think ultimately that's going to be the one that helps I think China win, but it will be close. It, it, yeah, America, they do have a lot of good AI. Do you think that there could ever be a situation where China and America, or Chinese and American companies, actually end up working together on AI? At the moment, I, I can't, because I think it's gonna be to do with the governments and what Trump will do, I don't know. Uh, Trump, uh, yeah, he, he wants to open up with AI. Uh, it depends how hard he's going to go with China. Um, it's a difficult one. This is more of a, a, a political one. I really do hope uh, that there can be collaboration. Because at the end of the day, AI is rubbish without the data. And China has a lot of data. America has a lot of data. China has more. But if you put them together, you're going to do so much good for it. So who knows? Let's see. Um, at the moment, it's a little bit tense. Mm. What's the um, what's the day-to-day -day life like working in a medical AI research lab? And because uh, you're still a student, I guess. So like, um, is it a lot more strenuous working or studying for a PhD in China as opposed to the UK? What's the um, oh yeah yeah like PhD way harder in China. Like the first I'd, I'd be graduated a couple years ago in the UK, um, but I don't think I would have learned as much um, doing so because. Um, yeah, I don't, in the UK, you don't. In most of Europe, you don't need to take classes. In China, you do the first couple of years. So research doesn't really begin until the third year. There's a huge exam which many people fail. It's called the qualifying exam. I know America, Canada, they've got that. So um, yeah, I know. Yeah, I'd probably say for PhD, US and China, they're like the hardest. But China, they've got a big push for publishing papers. You need to publish top tier SCI journals, first author. It is crazy, whereas in the UK, I know, no need to. You don't need to publish. So uh, sometimes I did regret, but now looking back, I'm pretty much finished now. I'm about to graduate. I'm like, you know what? It's worth it. I've, I've set myself up good. There's a lot of collaborations as well. So we, we work with companies, uh, hospitals. And so I feel like it's given me a lot of um, business acumen. I feel like I've learned uh, a lot and it's set me up for, for future uh, employments because I've got a lot of 
um, networking that's happened. Uh, sometime I've been to the hospital actually, I've worn like a white gown, really weird because I'm the only foreigner <laughs> doing it and everyone's like looking at me, uh, oh, why is there a white doctor? But uh, yeah, it's great, I've absolutely loved it. It's, uh, it's difficult but... Are the, um, are the academic standards higher in China, would you say, than the West, America, UK? Um, yeah, I think, well, for, for PhD, yeah, you've got the high requirements because you need to uh, publish more. Um, I guess, yeah, trying to do that, two reasons, it helps the university rankings go higher, but also helps with innovation. Um, but also in terms of exams, uh, in the UK, I feel like there's a little, a little bit more help. Maybe you get past papers and things like that. Um, maybe the professors might help you a little bit, but in China, when I ask, oh, can you give some kind of guidance what might be on the exam? Psh, nope. <laughs> the exams were super difficult. I've, like there was one exam where it was like you have to, it was a statistics exam, right? And they give you about 30 textbooks and we're not going to tell you what area it's going to be on, but study all of these and you'll be fine. I have no idea what type of questions. It was ridiculous. That was the one where many people failed. Nothing like that in the UK. Um, a lot of the time they want people to pass. So yeah, uh, it is tough, but uh, at the same time, it's manageable if you do the work. So what are the next steps then after the PhD, after you graduate? Um, do, you, do you see yourself moving back to the UK? Or what's the plan there? No, I'm... I'm well, um, the, the plan is um, I'm going to be going to Xinjiang, yeah. So I'm going to be going there uh, to live. To uh, Xinjiang? To, yeah, to Xinjiang, yeah. The northwest, oh. very far away <laughs> of China. I'm going to be going there um, probably for a year. Who knows? I don't know. Uh, I might love it there. I've just grown attached to it. I've been three times already uh, by myself. Love it to pieces. Uh, so I thought, why not just live there for a bit? Um, so who knows, but I love China, I think it's a uh, great place, many opportunities and in the future, uh, yeah, maybe I'd, I'd love to come back to Shanghai at some point, but I feel, especially in AI, there'll be, yeah, ample opportunities for that, whereas in the UK, I feel like AI not so much, there's not, there's not too many startups or anything going on there, so I'm happy. Okay, found a quieter spot to ask these rapid fire questions. Ready? Yeah. Okay, so just one word answers or short sentence. Let's have a look. Shanghai or London? Shanghai, for sure. Best thing about Chinese culture? Ooh. <laughs> the food, can I say? Okay. Biggest AI myth? That AI is a fad and it's not gonna take over jobs. I think it will. <laughs> Favorite Chinese phrase? Mama hu hu. <laughs> Oh, uh, cheapest meal you've had in Shanghai versus the most extravagant? Cheapest one at my university. It's like a proper big meal for like 10 RMB. It's pretty good. Um, most extravagant. Um, by like the bun's really nice view and it's like a Michelin, like a couple thousand or something. Okay. Beautiful, yeah. One piece of Chinese or one piece of China that you wish existed in the UK? Chinese culture or anything like that? Um, I think the safety, to be honest. Okay. And one aspect of UK culture that you wish existed in China? Um, or maybe like diversity. It's quite diverse uh, in terms of like population in the UK. Favourite Chinese social media app? Um, Xiao Hongshu. Why? Um, it's got everything. It's um, photos, videos. I like to store everything on there and uh, you can learn a lot on there as well. It's like traveling, go there for, it's great for tips. Yeah. Okay, and last one, let me find a good one. Do you think China's internet firewall, the great firewall, stifles innovation or protects national interests? No, otherwise I wouldn't be here. <laughs> okay, okay. Thanks for being part of this video, Luke. And if you want to go and find Luke's channel, I will link it in the description below. Thanks for watching and we will see you next time. See you. And lastly, final, final thing, me and my girlfriend have finally got around to starting a new Instagram page where we are posting daily videos and content of our life here in China. So if you want to go ahead and follow that page, you can find it in the description or in the pinned comment 
or just go and search Harvey in Shanghai. Thanks for watching and I will see you in the next video. Goodbye for now.